Hey, it's good to have you here. Come on in, have a seat. Welcome to the Beyond Picket Fences podcast. We are your hosts, Mandy Benicky and Naomi Marquez. Hi, Naomi. Hey, Mandy. How are you today? How are you doing? Are you typing? Oh, I was slapping my legs and drinking wine. Sorry. <laughs> I was like, are you working or <laughs> podcasting? No, oh, but I'm still in the closet in Florida. Hello. <laughs> So, um, I thought we'd talk today about, um, after pregnancy and after we give birth, what our experiences were, what do you think? Uh, that's one of those things. So we're going to do a podcast with, um, one of, one of our good friends or my good friend who is a new friend for you about shit. Nobody ever tells you. Mm -hmm. And so this is one of those specific times that nobody really specifically tells you and there's so many things right yes. there's so many things that happen both physically mentally um so and i know you've mentioned before what desiree um some difficulties that you had so why don't you talk about about that yeah yeah so i didn't admit my true um disconnect with being a mother to my daughter for years afterwards really embarrassed. So I had a fantastic pregnancy, loved every minute of it. And when I uh, went into labor is when I experienced negativity with my baby and the whole What do you mean negativity with your baby? So I, the process of giving birth to her was such a negative experience for me. I didn't feel love from my husband. I didn't feel love from my doctors. I didn't feel love from the hospital. And there was a- Did you have an emergency C-section or was it a scheduled? It was an emergency. So I was supposed to be a scheduled um, C-section. I was two weeks past the due date. So they were going to induce me the day I delivered anyway, but I happened to go into labor that day day before, and I had to have an emergency cesarean at 3.30 in the morning, the day I was supposed to be induced. So December 20th of 1995, I am, I went to the hospital for the first time at four o'clock in the afternoon and I'm laughing, having a good time. And they sent me home and they said that I wasn't in labor and that I couldn't be in labor because I was smiling and having a good time. And I was like, wait, you lost your mucus plug, right? Yeah. 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 That was, yes. If you want to see my mucus plug, go ahead on Facebook. We have a post. (laughs) Go online. Go online. You're going to see a (laughs) mucus plug. Anyway. So I'd lost my mucus plug a couple hours after I was at the hospital and my contractions were about 30 seconds apart by the time I just couldn't stand it anymore. So my contractions were a couple minutes apart when I went to the hospital. And they told me that I wasn't having contractions and they sent me home because I was smiling and having a good time. Then by about midnight, my contractions were 30 seconds apart and I was in so much pain. I could not stand it. I'm calling the hospital and they're telling me if I can speak that I'm not in labor and they wouldn't let me come. So my husband at the time was hungover and couldn't, didn't want to get up. So I called my mom crying and I was like, they won't let me come to the hospital. My contractions are 30 seconds apart. I know these are contractions. If they're not, I'm going to shoot myself in the head. Like, I just can't take it. She's like, we're going. So we get in the car, uh, wake my husband up. We get in the car. My mom meets me at the hospital and they start asking me all these questions. And the nurse says, if you can't handle these contractions, you're not going to be able to handle what's coming next. And my mom was to the left of me And I said, if this isn't contractions, kill me, mom. I cannot take this. My doctor comes in. No, I'm sorry. The nurse comes in to do an ultrasound and she does an ultrasound on my stomach because they, they did a, um, they did a vaginal exam and they said that I wasn't dilated. I was only dilated to like two. Mm -hmm. And they're like, you're nowhere close to having a baby. I'm like, something's wrong. I'm in so much pain. And they brought in a nurse to do an ultrasound And when they did the ultrasound, the nurse said, let me get back to you. I'm like, okay. And by this time, 
crying. I'm upset. I'm just emotionally just done. I, I'm not in love with the process at all. And the doctor comes in and he says, I'm sorry, but we have to take you in for an emergency um, cesarean. Your baby's breech. Oh. So I had been in labor this whole time, but she was breech. Mm -hmm. So they take me in for emergency cesarean. And by the, now I'm just like hysterical. And they were, do you want to be awake or do you want to be asleep? And I said, put me out because I'm, I was so upset. I couldn't even understand what was happening. I couldn't like looking back now, I should have been awake. I should have been awake. They should have kept me awake, but they gave me the option. I was young. I didn't know. Put me to sleep. Well, they already told you basically that what you were feeling wasn't painful. And, yes. you know, what was to come was going to be a lot more. Yeah. So why? <laughs> and that's scary. It's scary. And looking back now, if they would have kept me awake, I would have had those first touches and the first experience with my baby that mm -hmm. I see now I needed. So fast forward, I remember being hall I remember being in a hallway and like rolling and I remember like kind of opening my eyes but not really and screaming and I remember pain but I don't feel the pain but I remember being in pain and it sounds weird but my mom told me a couple of days after I gave birth that they were in the waiting room and they heard me screaming my mom's like she should not be feeling anything she just had her baby and they were, I guess they were wheeling me out to my room and I was screaming down the hallway because I could feel the pain. Mm. So, but I don't remember the pain. I just remember being in pain and I remember screaming and I remember the things around me. So I wake up and the room's dark and there's nobody that I remember being in the room with me. And I remember the first thing I just felt my stomach and there was no baby in my stomach. And I freaked the fuck out. And I was like, where's my baby? Where's my baby? Where's my baby? And I'm looking around and I can't see anything. And I remember there's a phone to the left and I grabbed the phone and I said, where's my baby? And they said, we'll be right in. And rewind, I had gone to all these classes at the hospital for birthing and breastfeeding and, mm -hmm. you know, postpartum and like all this stuff. Right. And in the breastfeeding class, they specifically said, the breast, the um, breastfeeding method that a baby uses is much more difficult than a bottle. So when you introduce the bottle to the baby and it's an easier sucking method, a lot of times the baby will not uh, latch onto the breast because it's a harder method. So mm -hmm. when they brought in my baby, I was like, I want to breastfeed. And they're like, we've already fed your baby. And I freaked out. And I said, she's not going to take my breast. She's not going to take my breast. And I remember they put her on me and I was angry. I was angry, not at her, but again, the process. So you think now I had her at 3.30 in the morning. It's four hours later. So it's 7.30 on the 21st of December. I started labor around four o'clock on the 20th. So, you know, this is a long duration of time that I've had a really negative experience. And at the time I didn't realize it. I was I was thankful I had a healthy baby. I was thankful that I made it out and things were good. When I look back now, that is the start of my inability to connect with my daughter. Mm -hmm. So um, I breastfeed her for um, about 10 days. And in that 10-day process, my nipples become uh, mm -hmm. blistered raw, mm -hmm. chapped, bleeding. It was so painful. And I was so determined to breastfeed her because it was the right thing to do. And no one ever told me I had to breastfeed, but it, there was something in my mind that said, you need to breastfeed, Naomi, you need to breastfeed. I don't remember there being pressure from anybody to breastfeed. So that wasn't my experience with breastfeeding. I know a lot of women have that experience that they were pressured into breastfeeding. I yeah, wasn't. I truly sure. Yeah. Yeah. I truly believe it was my own soul, my own being, my own um, inner knowledge that I needed to have that to connect with her. So I just kept pushing through it. Your 
So you are an extreme, you're like an empath. So you're an extremely empathetic person. You feel the feelings of everyone around you and that's how you connect with them. So I can see where you would have to have that physical connection with your daughter, you know? Yes. Yeah. And, you know, um, and for me at the time, I didn't realize that that was what that drive was for me. Right. So I go to the hospital and I called the hospital and I said, I don't know what to do. My boobs are massive. I'm in so much pain. Um, she's not eating that much. I'm not allowing her to take a bottle because they told me not to do it in my classes. I think she's mm-hmm. starving. My nipples are bruised and chapped and bleeding and blisters. And they said, come in. We have a breastfeeding class tomorrow night. Come in. So I went to the breastfeeding class and they took a pump and they pumped me completely dry. And they said, okay, mm-hmm. we're going to help you latch on with your baby now. It was one little swoop of my finger that I was missing in a technique mm-hmm. to get her to latch. That's it. One little swoop. Instead of taking the whole aora, you know, areola, and she was just nap, you know, latching on to the nipple piece. I didn't know. And it was just after mm-hmm. that, it was great. So, you know, well, I, I think <clears throat> you know, just no, go ahead. sorry. In my own experience, like I, I went through a lot of what you did, especially with my son, uh, who's my firstborn. Um, I, you know, I had this this idea that it's a natural instinct that it would just happen and it would be natural and beautiful and it'd be fine. And um, I don't know that I've talked to anybody who, with their first baby. Um, that it was like that, like the baby just latched on and they were great. You know, I had bleeding nipples. He was drinking the blood. I mean, it was, it was bad. It was so bad. And like you, when I finally had somebody physically show me how to do it, it's like, yeah, like you said, like one just simple movement of of your, you know, breast into their mouth or whatever, and they're fine. But what? shit they never tell you you know well, I mean, this we is went a through thing. a breastfeeding they, class come on well <laughs> and they did show me at the hospital but what the fuck am I remembering at the hospital right you know you're you're in awe about this little human being that is now your responsibility and all the information they're giving you and you're supposed to retain what you know nobody and that's what's missing in like health care for women is somebody who comes to your house and touches base with you after a day or two, what's wrong, what's going on. I remember I fell off the bed. So I had Desiree, so I'd, I'd only been a couple days and I had a really tall bed with these big poster, with these big posters, big posts, you know, mm-hmm. and I had, have, had mirrors, you know what I mean? I love, you know, the whole sex thing. It was a really fantastic <laughs> bed. Young man, and, me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's me. Anyway, so I'm on my bed and I have Desiree and she's laying on my chest. And I went to go get off the bed and I fell. And because I had a cesarean, I didn't have the ability to move my lower half of the body. And when I fell, I fell Mm. strategically. So my back hit the floor, but she was still on top and I couldn't get a phone. Our landline was, you know, on the other side of the bed or whatever it was. So I laid there and I was just in awe of one, my ability to save my daughter. I was like, wow, that was really great. And then I was scared. I was scared. Mm-hmm. Right. And, you know, you, so you had, you had a ton of stitches, obviously. Yeah. Did you, were you okay? Yeah, I was fine. I was fine. And the mentally though, I was not fine. I wasn't fine. Mm-hmm. And, you know, when I think back to when I realized that I was attached to Desiree, the way a parent should be attached to a daughter or a son, so the way a parent should be attached to their child, for me, the way I want to be connected with my child, my child, it took me over eight months. Wow! To connect to her, and the thing and that how long, saved so me. So how long did you breastfeed her? Eight months. The thing that saved me was breastfeeding her, because that connection of her being with me and not being able to get a babysitter, not being able to. Um, rely on other people. I had to take care of her. I was her sole provider of nutrients. And I had to be the one to 
uh, pick her up from daycare because she was hungry and she needed to eat. And I would go there mm-hmm. at my break to the daycare to feed her, right? Like it forced me to be so engaged with her and breastfeeding is what saved me as a parent. Hey, we wanted to take just a moment to ask you to head on over to our Patreon page and become a Patreon member. If you have been enjoying our podcasts, we offer bonus episodes and live Zoom table talks to our Patreon members. For just $2.99 per month, you can access all these additional goodies. The funds we raise through Patreon help pay for the costs of software and production programming we need to keep this podcast running. To sign up, go to patreon.com, that's P A T. R E O N dot com slash beyond picket fences slash join. We thank you from the bottom of our hearts for all of your support. Now back to the show. For, mm-hmm. You know, I, I love to party, I love to drink, I love to smoke. You know, I have I'm a very active person. I in regards to um social engage, engagement. And I was a young parent, you know, I was early twenties. Mm-hmm. So You know, for me, when I finally connected with her was after we stopped breastfeeding and the loss of that breastfeeding, that's when I fell deeply in love with her. And I, Mm -hmm. it's, it's never, it's amazing. I just love it. But it was that moment when I stopped breastfeeding her that I realized how connected I was to her, but it, it took that long for me to, to feel that. And I think that women are shamed if you're like, oh my gosh, the feeling of being a mom, it's so incredible. And it's so this, it's the love you're never going to know. And I'm like, I don't feel that. Mm -hmm. I I didn't feel it. Yeah. And like you said, I'm a very passionate person. I love deeply. I care tremendously. And I just didn't have it. Right. And it took me years to admit it. Years years. I can't even remember the first person I admitted that to. But anyway, so I wanted to talk about it. I wanted to, you know, I want, you know, women to know that it's okay. And everybody loves their children, you know, in different ways and everybody has their own connection, but it's understandable. Yeah, it's interesting. If if you don't have that connection Um, and why that looks, and I think it's important, you know, what I see is not holding my baby for the first time and not having that baby put on my bare skin. It's incredible how much of a difference that makes. Incredible. And I think when you're talking about that, I did not have a C-section with either kid. Um, But my son, so I was induced with both because I had big babies (laughs) and they were afraid I was going to have to have a C-section if I let them go longer. And luckily um, I did. I was induced because they were big. Um, So with my son, um, I, I was actually in labor and I did not know this at the time, but every time I had a contraction, um, both his heart rate and my heart rate would go to a dangerous level. And I didn't know this because obviously they're not going to tell me because I'd panic, but my husband, Jonathan knew it, the nurses knew it. And so they prepped the room for an emergency C-section and they had, you know, everyone in there. And they said, we're going to give you one more chance to push, but that's all you get. Like basically what I realized now they were saying is that's all we think that you have in you uh, and, or we're, you know, we're going to take you in for an emergency C-section. So, um, I had that, that last chance to push and the nurse, um, that was there with me, I don't, they must have a specific name. It's maybe the labor nurse or I don't know, one that really coaches you right there. Um, she was like, you listen to me and we're going to get this baby out right now. And so she, she was amazing. She, she coached me on like, this is how you push. Um, this is how hard I want you to push. And, Eventually she got on my stomach and she, yeah, I'm, I'm making a, she pushed my stomach while I was pushing and, um, he came out, but he came out and he wasn't breathing. He was blue. Um, and what had happened is Owen, oh, his, 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 he, his, um, so he was, he wasn't breathing. He was blue. So he was born. There was no crying. Um, they took him away. 
um, to, I don't, I don't even remember if they took him out of the room or if they just took him to the corner of the room and were working on him. How scary for you. Um, and so, yeah, so I knew I had had him, but I didn't hear him. Right. And, um, so it wasn't very long and they had him crying. So what had happened, I found out later as he was born, um, the cord was around his neck. So every time I contracted, my body was pushing him out and the cord was pulling him back. So he was strangling. Um, so, you know, he was born, not breathing yeah. essentially. So yeah. they got him breathing. Um, and at some point they, you know, brought him to me, but they realized between then and that, and, you know, when they brought him to me, his arm wasn't moving, he wasn't moving one of his arms. And so <clears throat> what was going through um, there was just at his... that time, like, but at this time processing it. Well, I mean, a lot, because a lot had happened before then. You know, I had written out this birth plan. It's your your first baby. So you're, um, you know, I had this three-page long birth plan that was going to go according to plan. I wasn't, it was all going to be natural. I wasn't going to have any drugs. And uh, because, because the cord was around his neck, um, and like I was experiencing, and and because I was induced, I was experiencing pretty extreme contractions. And, um, I think also because of some prodding, because of the doctor and the nurses knew that I was in trouble. And so was he, they're like, you need drugs to relax. And so it took some convincing to get me to take the drug. So already like my adrenaline, adrenaline was pumping. I was already upset that I had, you know, taken, you know, the epidural, um, and that things weren't going as I had planned. And then he wasn't, I I couldn't hear him. And you always, Mm -hmm. you know. When, yeah. when a baby's born, you always, yeah, that's the right. first thing. Ah, oh, the yes. cry, you know, mm-hmm. blah, blah, blah. Um, so there was, there was definitely um, a period where I didn't get to see him. Um, it wasn't that long. Um, but what had happened, why his arm wasn't moving is because when the nurse pushed on my belly, um, she cracked his collarbone. Um, so he was born with a broken collarbone, which I didn't actually find out until like his first appointment with the pediatrician after he had been home. She felt uh-huh. his collarbone and there was a lump there. And she said, oh, his collarbone's broken. You knew that, right? And I said, oh, no. Uh, no. Nobody no. Had mentioned that. Yeah. <laughs> so, Nobody um, mentioned that. Thanks. Yeah. So, uh, so eventually I was, you know, eventually – meaning probably within 15, 20, 30 minutes. I don't know. Um, I was connected. They, you know, brought Weston to me and put him on my belly and I tried to feed him and it was awkward and, you know, feeding, he wasn't latching properly. And, um, I did have a breastfeeding coach in the hospital that helped me, but he never really like latched on, um, for probably a good month or two. Um, I was still able to feed him enough Um, but, um, but just, you know, between, you know, that experience of not having him right away, um, brought to me or put on my belly or whatever. Um, and then him being my first, first born, I can remember going home and I felt so, first of all, I felt like there's no way this baby's going to survive the night. Like there was a hospital that was, you know, (laughs) keeping him alive. And now he's here with with just the two of us who have no idea what to do. I'm like, talk about shit they don't tell you about when you give birth. Like you're, I had stitches in my vajayjay because I tore and um, you're, you're bleeding and you're stitched up and you're swollen. You can't sit down. You can't, you can barely walk and you're trying to hold them while you're, can barely walk. And I'm thinking, God, I'm going to drop this kid. Mm -hmm. I'm going to lose too much blood and pass out with him. You know, there's just all these things. You're just so scared when you go home. And that's the stuff they don't help you through. Like all these classes I took, nobody said, Hey, these are the fears. Like it's a a, a, woman, a woman. I I, I never had women telling me that everyone's like, Oh, it's so great. It's like, no, these are the things. No. I remember staring at him as he slept not because I was so enamored with him because I want to make he was sure he was still breathing, yes. you know? Yeah. And then of course you're not, you're not getting any sleep. And so you're mm-hmm. exhausted trying to breastfeed like <laughs> and not do it very well. Um, 
And so my connection with him was a lot different than it was with my daughter um, because I had already known how to, I've, I had already, I breastfed him for a year. Um, wow. And so I had already had that experience with him. And when she was born, um, she was a very quick birth, no problems, came right out, put her right on my belly. She went right to the breast, no problem. She latched right on um, because I knew what I was doing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, And so her and I had a bond like right from the second she was Mm -hmm. born. Um, It's that skin to skin, heart to heart. mm -hmm. It's so important. Mm -hmm. So important. Yeah. And, you know, understanding, you know, how, the issues that your son had, that heart to heart, even, you know, not saying it should be right away because they needed to pull him away, but it's one of those things that they've got to get it to you as soon as possible. And they need to let you know how that will impact you because you didn't have that. Right. Right. Right? Well, and you you have the two experiences, you know, the difference, right. You know, the connection and, how when you think about the baby's connection, like with yes. both Desiree and with Weston, when they're born, I mean, that, that's got to be crazy, right? Like they're used to being in your body. And then all of a sudden they're in this bright light, this room, there's the all these trauma. things, they have no idea mm-hmm. what they are. Um, mm-hmm. And then they're not introduced to the one thing that they know. Yeah. That's, I mean, the it's it's got to be so different. So wow, I didn't think it's about no their surprise experience. that their connection is is probably different too, you know? Wow. That's insights. Yeah. Yeah. I never thought about their connection. So for you, when did you, when did you get connected, I guess, with Weston or how did that? Weston probably took a few months. I think him and I really started connecting more when he was able to, gosh, what is it around maybe two and a half, three months when they can start, um, showing emotions, smiling, engaging with you. Yeah. Um, and I'm the type of parent, like every, every year the kids grow older. That's my favorite year. I'm not a baby mom. I don't see other people, other people's babies. I don't want to hold them. I don't connect with them. It doesn't make me want to have any, I'm just not a, a baby person. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. and, and so since I didn't have that connection with him, it was more like, you know, I loved him, but um, because I had Elon, I can compare the two connections. And, um, so I would say, gosh, it was probably like three, four months. Yeah. You know what? I remember, I remember the, I literally remember when I fell just deeply in love with Desiree. And it's that unconditional love that I've never felt before. Mm-hmm. I always say that. Your kids can tell you the meanest things and all they have to do is say, I'm so sorry, mom. I love you so much. I just had a bad day. I'm like, okay, that's so great. There's nobody else in my life I'll do that for, you know, like I'm not, I'm not going to forgive people, my husband, my siblings, my parents, Mm -hmm. my friends, but I'll forgive my kids. I think about when, you know, you get a hug from your kid. There's nothing like that. Your, uh, yeah, even the the hug from your spouse or your friends or you know whatever or your parents is so amazing. different. Like the hug from your kids is it's it's a, it's a bond, you know. It's the and only bond that you know. Yes, truly, and that's like, the thing that's right to your heart. It's the thing that's missing. It's interesting. There's a Facebook at least with post. me. I don't want to say that with everybody. So. <laughs> yeah, for sure, for sure. There was a Facebook post today by um, one of my friend's daughters, and she said the best moment of my day today. I opened up my arms and my daughter ran to me. Right. And Mm -hmm. I think about, you know, Desiree was eight months when, um, when I really had that connection and she was already walking, crawling, sorry, long time crawling. Mm -hmm. And she would crawl and that, you know what I mean? I think about, I didn't have that moment with her when she was crawling and running around. There wasn't that like, Oh, you just filled my day. Right. And um, I'm really, really happy that I got there. I'm glad that I had him. Yeah. So because not everybody does. Yes. And you know, and I don't know. I just, I just wish like 
it was presented to us in a more truthful manner, you know? Well, and we take all those classes. We all do. (laughs) And, you know, it would be nice if they said, you know, this is the reality of what can happen. And these are the resources that you can reach out to if this happens, you know? It's funny. No, it's so true because Desiree, so um, she's, um, they're trying to have a baby right now, her husband. And she goes, mom, Mm -hmm. you're so honest. You make me not even want to have a baby. And I'm like, I know, but this is all the stuff no one's going to tell you. I know it's not, I'm not doing Care Bears and Rainbows right now, but this is the reality. Yeah. My reality was, so I want you to know what my reality was, because I wish, you know, that they would have told me my mom actually had very great. She had four kids. We were all massive 10 pound babies, but one, and she had them all naturally with nothing. She was great. Mm. Her experiences with breastfeeding were phenomenal. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like Some she, women love being pregnant. Love yeah, it, you know, I, I, I love being pregnant. But. I've got a girlfriend. She hated being pregnant. Um, but we all have different experiences. So I really appreciate, um, uh, the opportunity to tell everybody this and hoping that, um, give some women some space to know they're not alone in their after yeah. pregnancy journey. Yeah. Thanks and hopefully me. a few details for people like your daughter who are, uh, or are about to embark on it <laughs> but it's you know it can go a little bit differently <laughs> than you expect oh, it, but it's all okay it all turns out right it all turns out thanks you guys all thanks right. for listening we'll talk to you later thank bye. you next time bye bye